Welcome back to the missing tutorial. This is video number two, understanding data sets as texts. The purpose of this video are the following two main um, objectives. First, we're going to learn how to read common data formats and structures that you will encounter out there in the wild. And the second main objective is understanding the links between these types of data and with their textual modes and how we can maybe start to see some connections between potential visual modes. Of course there are many but I'm going to show you some of the more obvious connections to get us thinking more clearly about their interconnections. Okay let's get going. Okay how to read CSV data or comma separated values. In this section, I'm going to review this particular example CSV data format and the data involved here in relationship to the chart that it creates that you see right here. I'll also talk about how this is actually one of the original charts that I was looking through in the D3 gallery as I was thinking about trying to create this, this temporal chart. And finally, I'm also going to compare this CSV data to Rodolfo's tabular data that you see right here. So we can start to see some cross connections between um, essentially the textual modes that we see in the CSV data and the Google Sheets data with then the visual modes that we see represented in these charts. So let's begin. Here we have CSV data, and there's some ways we can describe CSV data. One description is called a flat file because it's in two dimensions. And by two dimensions, we can represent that visually as the following. Notice how there's line breaks between, let's say, these different lines that we see here. So those represent rows. And as we can see, every new line break, we can assume then that's a new row of observations of data. So I can draw a little line down here saying, OK, if we go down linearly, we can then see one dimension of the data. And then if we go um, horizontally this way, we can see another dimension at work. Let's take a peek here. We have a couple of things going on. We have this first line right here. Notice how it's different. This is called the header. And this includes the name of the columns. And then every line thereafter is assumed to be the beginning of the data. That is, for each column then, you can see now how the, the commas come into place. So if I highlight some of these commas here in this first line, oops, almost missed one. We have in the header, we have, let's see here, year. Let me switch colors for a sec. We have year, and then we have the actual value of 1980. Then we have variable A, followed by underneath it, if we follow the scheme here, the first or the second comma separated value would be 70, and so on and so forth. And this repeats throughout the entire file. So that's how you read a CSV file. Let me erase some of that. If we compare that to Rodolfo's data in a table over here, we see similar things at work in a table. So if I grab my highlighter and or actually I'm going to grab my lines, you can see here we have the data moving vertically and horizontally in the same way. The only thing that might be different is you're wondering like, okay, well, what about this little space right here? Ooh, that's an ugly. This little space right here. Well, it's an assumption built into Rodolfo's table. We might label that in a CSV as weeks. And then we would assume then instead of variable A, B, C, and so on, we'd have um, these particular year as labels, years as labels. We can modify them as needed, but then you can kind of see how, okay, the idea of a two dimensions here, 
is we have, we can compare week one to then uh, the year and do that multiple times. And so the, the idea of two dimensions and the ability, the ability to cross compare um, something across a, a horizontal and vertical axis are embedded in both the CSV and table um, textual modes, if you will. Now if we cross over now to the charts, recall how the CSV data, the textual modes, we have the, again, horizontal and vertical two-dimensional modes. We have the header with the column information that then uh, track the separation of values per column with the commas. So we have 1980, the year through 2015, and then we have all those variables A through D with different values uh, that are then charted as follows. So let's take a peek here. We have along the bottom x-axis moving horizontally the years. And then remember how every um, year had um, those different variables. So those four variables are then posted along the y-axis, so that's the second dimension, same as the CSV. So it's just another way to represent, correct? So we can pull out the data, show it differently, so we can perhaps see it better um, over time. This was also influential in my own thinking, since I thought, oh, my variables are years. So each market year will have its own line, and that means if we go back to the uh, tabular data, what becomes the x-axis? Well, it's the weeks. So each week is listed across the x-axis. If we go here, here are our weeks along the x-axis. And along, of course, y then would be the number of postings. And then our variables are the years. So we can compare for each year and each week of that year how many posts were there is the embedded question in that particular um, data set. So that's how we can start to see some connections between the textual and visual modes. It may seem obvious, but hopefully um, we can, it'll open your eyes to perhaps some other kinds of charts that you see out there that might use something like a CSV data um, and how to structure that information. But the main goal here, remember, how do we read something like this, this CSV data? It is a highly common, prevalent format that you might encounter, you will encounter. So it's good to know how they work and the best way to structure them and the assumptions that are usually built into them and how they compare something across two dimensions. Okay, so let's move on to the JavaScript object notation data format. Welcome back. This is how to read JSON or JavaScript object notation. And I'm going to show you again the relationships between uh, the textual modes of JSON objects and how they could be potentially rendered visually as a certain kind of diagram. Uh, so here on the left side we see the visualization and on the right side we actually this is the data for this visualization so my plan is to walk you through the connections between the data and the visualization how to read this JSON object because it looks if you've never seen one before it might look kind of intimidating how do you read this there's some visual cues that you might grab onto right away with the hierarchies but Let's walk through it together. So I'll supply again these URLs, uh, the links to these particular items, but if they're not around, um, you can definitely just follow along right here. Okay, so first, how did I even know where to look for this data? If you're curious about learning about data and data visualizations out there with some examples you find in the wild, one thing I'd like to show you is, well, you have browsers and you can always view the source of a page. It's a very powerful thing, right? Um, so if I right click, click on view source, I get this. 
So if you have an underlying assumption or uh, uh, knowledge about how to read HTML, web pages, uh, you can navigate your way a little bit. And once you get stronger with your programming with JavaScript, you should be able to navigate these as well. Um, but once you start also reading data, you should be able to assume like what kinds of uh, at one point this this project obviously has to use data so I can f sometimes narrow down where it is and then look at it so I can that helps me um, understand what's going on in the visualization and how they're connected the textual uh, uh, data values with the actual visualization somebody created so it's, it's a significant part of the process for me when I learn something as well so if I click Command F or Control F, which is finding something on a page textually. I'll type in dot, in this case, I know it's dot JSON, and I, I could also assume so. You should also then see how there's some hits. This first, we're, we're not learning how to read JavaScript yet in the tutorial, but we can see at this moment right here that this is where they actually pull in the data to then visualize it later in this code. Uh, d3.json is, uh, d3 represents the idea of the d3 code library that's being used here. Now you can go back up here where they pull it in so the browser knows to use it because it has a method called json which will retrieve some kind of file, in this case a json file. And sure enough, in the folder that houses the same um, uh, HTML document, the path uh, here to the, the um, data file is data.json. So I, what I did is I copied this and if you look again on the right side here you'll see the URL is exactly the same except it has forward slash data.json and within this sure enough within the same folder as the, the um, HTML file there's the data. Cool. So if you want to peruse Things in the wild, view page source again is always a, a beautiful thing. All right. What I want to do now is compare this data over here with how they visualized it on the left side. Well, it's not too, it's, well, it's cumbersome to be able to walk you through the data, the JSON object here, on, without being able to collapse different things and highlight certain parts of it rather than this one big blob of it. So here's what I did. I copied or I selected everything, copied it, and then I went to a pretty fire uh, app on the web and you can just type in JSON pretty or prettify or format whatever. It, it should give you something where I copy it in and then I can click on make pretty. It was actually pretty pretty already, <laughs> but here's what this does for me. Check this out. Note here that there's a curly brace, and a curly brace in JavaScript and some other programming languages uh, denotes this idea of what follows is an object, and in this case a JSON object is what's called an object array. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to close this completely Notice how there has to be a closing curly brace. That's what's called scope. Scope is you start something denoted by some, uh, uh, usually some kind of syntax. So in this case, the notation is curly braces, object begin. And curly, close curly braces, object close. So the complete object is encapsulated by a curly brace, uh, curly braces uh, as you see here. All right, well, let's open it up a little bit. And now I'm going to do something else. Though. I'm going to do this. I'm going to close up this one. Inside this uh, JSON object, there's actually only two uh, values, two objects that are, as you can see here, look, there's a comma that separates them. One's called name. This is called, on one side, a key, colon, and then on uh, the other side of the colon, there's always going to be some kind of data type. In this case, we see two quotation marks that are empty, actually. Quotation marks like this mean a string. That is, you usually find some kind of text in there. So 
So right now we see that the value of name, or sorry, key, name, value, well, nothing. If we look at the visualization, check this out, right? We have the first instance of this chart that is hierarchical with nothing here. Hmm. Well, let's go back to the data. You notice how there's a second value, a second object with a key name children. Hmm. And then now let's take a look. Instead of it being a string data type, we have something else. Colon value of what? What is that? We have an open square bracket and a closed square bracket. That denotes what's called an array, a list of something. Let's open up that list of children. There's quite a bit. Let's let's collapse it though. This is the practice you need to do. Oh, there's only two objects that are in this array of children. Okay, well let's take a look at the visualization again. I'm going to open up that first instance that's unnamed. And now we have one two children. It's pretty on the nose with regards to that key name by the way, right? Children. So I thought that might help us here. All right, well, let's look at the line numbers here that are represented. We have four, and it, it just goes right away to 57. That's going to tell you there's a lot of content in between. So let's open up the first child. We have the name, key, value, a string of text interactive tools. Some uh, uh, particular patterns, right? You're starting to see already. I'm going to notice here how there's another one, key, free, true. I don't even know what that means because I haven't looked at the code yet. There's a description with another text value. Again, I'm not sure how that's used. I might maybe a tooltip if I hover over. I don't know. Let me check. Yeah, there we go. You see a little tooltip, interactive authoring tools. So they coded it so that when you hover, you get that message. Oh, cool. Okay, well now we see another instance of a key name children with another array, so of objects. Because again, new object is always, when you see that curly brace, that means it has to also be closed somewhere. We have two children under interactive tools, apparently. Let's check that idea. Sure enough, we have browser-based and desktop. Is that it? Browser-based, same thing, description. So it's following a pattern. You can start to see the patterns. And it also has children, which we saw. I'll close that up. And then the second child should be what? Desktop? Sure enough, it is. And then also, let's see, it has two children. Let's see here. Uh, maybe I missed something here. Browser based. Oh, it has many children. I just clicked the wrong one. So there we go. So it has an array of objects. And that has four. So we should have four and two. Four in the browser based. One, two, three, four. Two in the desktop. Boom. So just through this quick glancing of, okay, here's a JSON object. There's a hierarchy being constructed of objects that are in lists separated by commas, but you also have to consider how there's a key value pair to create those objects. So we have an object, in this case, the first um, hierarchical level is name on no name, and then we have children, and then a list of children. We know that there's two and on that level, we have interactive tools and coding. So I'm opening up that one. With It has its children. And we could keep going down the line, right? I won't belabor the point, but I hope you can start to see that, in this case, it's rather on the nose, again, that uh, hierarchy is represented visually and textually um, within the JSON object. Um, we have den denotations through um, 
keys listed as you see here that are separated by commas but you can always start new levels of hierarchy by creating a new object or a list of objects even separated by commas themselves so we have interactive tools open close coding open close but then it can also have a list of children objects itself right here's a list of children here's the first one browser based we close it comma start up the next one desktop what one last thing I'll have you remember or kind of understand and see and, and, and make sure you understand is that the commas separate um, every new object but if you get to the last object you'll see how there's actually no comma correct so it the comma is to suggest that there's something after it tells the computer there's something new coming um, so check for it so if, if I were to put a comma here and try to run the code for this visualization it wouldn't fly um, it would actually show me throw an error and, and, and um, tell me that they're expecting something so that's one little small detail to also note all right you may be wondering why am I having you learn how to read JSON one it's again a very common data format that you're going to encounter especially if you code with JavaScript and web-based data visualizations including especially if you're using the code library the d3.js code library another reason specific to this tutorial is that I had to retrieve Rodolfo's data as a JSON object so even though the market comparison data that Rodolfo created is in a Google Sheet in a tabular format that originally I talked about it in relationship to CSV um, the CSV data format the way I had to retrieve this dynamically is through a JSON object so how does that look let's take a look if I get to the uh, code here and we're not gonna I'm not assuming you're learning or learning how to read code yet but what I can do is show you something real quick what it looks like as a JSON object so I can show you here in my document code I have a link to Rodolfo's JSON feed version of his data so I'm gonna go back so here it is again in the Google, Google sheet and Google enables me to then render it as the following Wow right <laughs> can you imagine opening this up for the first time and trying to make sense of it it's given me a lot more than I ever would need in the data uh, but how would we even approach this let's use that prettyfy app again and let me just show you what's going on here It'll be good practice so I'm going to open this up in a new window since we don't need to see everything and I'm going to replace what we had before I just copied and pasted Rodolfo's JSON feed into here and I'm going to make it pretty over here what do we notice right away open closed curly brace suggesting one JSON object but inside of it let's take a look we have at the first level three key value pairs version encoding and feed you can take a guess where I had to kind of dig into right what level it's probably feed right so these are just headers if you will of version numbers and encoding information encoding is just a, st a standard uh, Unicode um, international standard for all character types that's about as much we need to know here but inside feed we have a lot going on as well let's take a look I have ID updated let me just keep going through the line category title link author some other things oh there we go inside feed I have one two three four five six seven eight 9, 10, 11, and 12 items at the next level. 
So within the data object, I have feed. Inside feed, I have a lot of things. So this is how I went about it. This is how I read JSON objects. I try to simplify them. For the sake of time, I want us to look at the last one under entry. So Google has defined a standard for their sheets, JSON, object, and entries are where we have our data. Inside there we can see, look, entry is actually going to be what? What is this called again? It's a square bracket. So it's opening it up and closed. That means it's a list of something. Most likely it's going to be what? A list of objects. So we could just keep going through here and um, dun, dun, dun. keep going. How many are there? If you knew the data and how many weeks Rodolfo um, looks at, it's 17. And sure enough, if you counted them all, we got them right there. Weeks 1 through 17. Inside each entry, we then have multiple things we could look at. ID, updated, category, title, content, link, and then all of a sudden we have something that should look familiar all of a sudden. We have this gobbledygook stuff right here uh, um, that means something with regards to how, one, Google defines um, certain cell values, but also maybe perhaps how um, Rodolfo might have defined something. I'm not sure. Um, I never looked into that. But what I knew is that there's a key of this value that then has a list of objects inside of it. So, or multiple objects inside of it. It's actually not a list. It's just multiple objects. So the first object we have even inside each one another nested um, sorry, that was what I was alluding to. It has another nested uh, key value pair. So we might take a guess that T means the cell value and how it's been typed in the sheets. When I say typed, I mean the data type. So T might represent what? Text of some kind or maybe some kind of open text value. So here we have a string, week one, and then all the week one values per what? Year. You can see how the year data is not here, right? That year label, I should say. So that's something I noted right away. I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I have week of each week as an object inside of entry. And I get to these particular per instances. Let me close up that one. And I have week two here and it rinse and repeat but I don't have the year information. Hmm. How, how am I going to restructure this? Because I'm going to need that, correct? I can't just not have that label. Um, so how do I put them together? It's not anywhere else either. So that's the one thing I was thinking like, okay, there's going to be some data processing there. And I'm going to have to think about how to actually reorganize the information so that I can also make sure I bundle the um, uh, the year data in relationship to this weeks per week um, postings. So that's, if you will, the, how I came to the realization, oh, okay, I got some work to do before I create that temporal chart um, that's multi-aligned. And yeah, this has hopefully helped you provide some tools to take something like a JSON blob object and turn it into something you can really simplify, start to see the hierarchy and the different types of data that can be included inside of a JSON object. There are other things that can be included and of course this will look differently based, based on things you find in the wild but again this is a baseline um, uh, video to help you get there and feel more comfortable about at least where to begin and so let's move on to the final video that has to do with a particular data structure called a matrix in this part we're going to learn how to read what's called a matrix 
which is just a list of lists that help you develop some cross comparisons to see what kinds of relationships are between those different variables. So one common visualization that you might be aware of is a relational chart called a chord diagram. And in this example here on Nadia Bremer's page, Visual Cinnamon, is a very particular kind of chord diagram, but it's a great example because she breaks down the relationship between the, the matrix that she developed in relationship to her chord diagram idea. And in this case, we have two set, two main categories of value of variables. We have variable A, B, and C on one side, and on the other we have X, Y, and Z. And in this example case, um, these are just abstracted name, general names for, um, as we'll see below, values having to do with um, education versus occupation. So we have six variables that have been broken up into two main categories visually here on this, this chart. And it then shows you the persistent links, the amount by the width, the bandwidth, right, um, connecting to certain um, other variables over in the other set. How did that become a thing and how is that actually connected to the data set itself? If we look down here, this is what we call a matrix. So a matrix, as, as um, Bremer notes here, are meant to help you cross compare things. So how do you read this? We actually have Again, kind of this idea of a two-dimensional thing, but it's it's ordered in such a way that there's actually more going on than just, let's say, a, um, a simple CSV. We have repeating variables. So we have, again, X, Y, Z, C, B, A connect to the main variables we just saw before. And in this particular case, we have uh, lines that Bremer um, provides for us that are implicit in the structure of the data. So what we do is we do it like this. We, we compare the idea of like how many times does x um, connect to x, x to y, x to z. Well, obviously not any because in this case they are part of the same category, but now we have x to c. Oh, they uh, can be compared um, or there's a link there um, 10 times, x to b 5, x to a 15 times. So if we go back up to the chart real quick and compare x to those x occupations to these values of CBA and education, we have x to a, x to c here in yellow, and then x to b here, and b was 5, I believe, so that's why it's the thinnest um, band between the two. So that's how you read a matrix, and she breaks it down easily. Um, that I won't belabor here, but the main goal to see is how you organize your information in a matrix to facilitate cross-comparison and really correlation between um, existing variables in a data set. How many times do they overlap? Another way to, um, another name for it is co-occurrence. Um, and so how many times do these co-occur? That's how you read a matrix. It's, it's, and how does this look in the code? And why did I say it was a list within a list? If you look down at Bremer's note, is this what it look, would look like in JavaScript? You could define a matrix. And then you can see here, Remember how square brackets mean that's a list, and it ends here. But within this list, we have one, two, three, four, five, six lists, each representing um, the different variables. And we can see how this idea we have, again, where we actually get those values of uh, cross comparisons connect back up to here and uh, that facilitation of it, right? So that's how uh, matrices work. There's a lot, actually a lot more like statistical knowledge bound up in matrices, um, but that I won't belabor here, but the whole idea is how can we test interrelationships between um, variables in a data set? That's what a matrix 
is designed to do. It's a more um, complex form of um, comparison based on what kinds of questions you have of the data. And then obviously too, um, there's, that's connected to the way you'd want to visualize it. One example that I think has been widely used is the chord diagram. And again, Nadia Bremer's work and her blog posts are really good at breaking down how did she get from her data to the, the actual uh, visualization. So here's a great example. If you, if you care to read more, uh, this is why I highlighted this blog post here. Okay, those are the three main types of uh, data formats that I really wanted to highlight um, in this tutorial series. So I hope you have a better sense about how to read a CSV, read a JSON um, object notation, JSON file, as well as um, understand that curly braces and square brackets mean different things. Commas help delimit the amount of things within, let's say, these lists and objects and objects that have lists inside of them, right? So we can see already that these forms of data sets in different formats provide a really um, interesting complex um, capacity to define relationships and then ask questions and facilitate analysis. That's what we're trying to do with visualization, right? Is um, test ideas we have about something in the world and then visualizations are meant to then highlight, illuminate some aspect of that. So I hope we can take this new knowledge about how to read data sets in different formats and structures into uh, the third video of the series where we actually look at the code of the rep map case. And that's the next part. How do we take a look at how I took um, Rodolfo's data and processed it into the visualization that we see um, on the web right now.